So what does H1B RFE mean? So H RFE is just a short form for request for further evidence. When you file any petition with USCIS, be it a B2 extension like we were discussing earlier, or you file an L1 or a H1, whatever it might be, family-based petition, there could be a request of, for further evidence from USCIS before they grant you the certain benefit that they're going to grant you. And then when you send the doc, they, usually there's um, a time, there is a document sent and they will give you a time period to respond to it. And if you don't respond within that time, then the case will automatically get denied. And if you respond and you the, you submit all the documentation they're requesting, then they will give grant you the benefit. If they're not satisfied with the documentation that you're submitting, then they could ask, send you another RFE. But most probably they won't. Most probably they'll just deny it. Uh, it's rare that they send two RFEs on, a, on the same case. So that's the process for the RFE. Okay. What is the probability that any random H-1B petition will be selected for an RFE? Um, sometimes you can predict that this case will be RFE'd for sure because you can identify the issues. Right, so some cases are just waiting to be RFP'd. Like if you file a petition for say a restaurant manager or some position that where you know you'll have to justify that it's a specialty occupation because it's not clear. It's not clearly a specialty occupation. For example, if you do a lawyer, it's clear that a bachelor's degree in law is required and a license is required. You are do a doctor, you know that there are no issues, but there's some positions where it's not clear that actually a bachelor's degree is required. For example, if you do a H1 for a computer programmer, uh, USCIS for sure, it, it, that's a red flag. Some positions are just red flags, marketing, research analyst, computer programmer, systems analyst. Just by the, because based on the way USCIS has been interpreting those cases, you know that you will get an RFE. So in those cases, you can say, there's a very high probability of an RFE maybe 80%, 70% probability. Or if you have not in status and you don't have an I-94 and you're filing without that, you know you'll get an RFE. So in some instances, the probability can even be 100%. <clears throat> but if the case is good, and in general, as a lawyer, you don't see any issues with the case, it can still be RFE. And the probability of that really depends on which administration, how USCIS is looking at cases. Under the Trump administration, 50% uh, of the cases were RFE'd. Uh, just every case was, you know, 50% was RFE'd. And out of that, 50% were denied. So there was a huge surge in RFEs. But in general, if there are no issues, there shouldn't be an RFE. And I think it's gotten back to that level now, uh, simply because of the constant fight, you know, companies and um, attorney organizations and uh, they have been litigating, litigating, litigating against um, the Trump administration and they have won some vital cases. And because of that, the RFEs have really um, gone down because they're not able to RFE on that basis. The courts have said you, you cannot. So they, you know, they can't go against the court. So they have, we, have, we have forcefully bottom down the RFE level, not because of USCIS or because, but because of the court system. Okay. So now we see the RFE rate is, um, if it's, you know, a provable case is pretty low. Yeah. What is the probability that the H1B petition will be approved if selected for an RFE? So again, I answered that question, right? So I said that uh, under the Biden, under the Trump administration, 50% of the cases were denied, the cases that were RFE'd. Uh, but now, it's, I think, fairer in the sense that they look at each case. They don't go with a presumption or some kind of a bias against, you know, certain consulting companies or certain types of H1, certain nationalities. It really depends on the type of case. So if I said, if there are red flags in that case, because the, they're clearly not approvable, then even if you respond to the RFE, unless you're able to show that it, the case is approvable under the law, the case is going to get denied. So it really depends on a case by case basis right now, which is how it should be. Yeah. And the RFE, like uh, how long to respond, like uh, two months or three months, like what would be the response? So it's usually 80, 80 days, I believe, or 85 days to respond to an RFE. And uh, because of COVID, 
they have automatically extended the RFE response period uh, and added 60 days to that. So from the end date, you can add 60 days, uh, whether it be a motion, an RFE, a notice of intent to revoke, notice of intent to deny, whatever it might be. You can add 60 days to it and respond. Uh, so that has been very, very useful for us and uh, companies and individuals because um, they have been delayed in getting, getting documents for example, change of status from, from F1 to H1, uh, the universities are closed and a lot of documents are required from the university. So there is a delay to get that document. So that 60 days grace period has really helped, I think the community, uh, you know, uh, respond during this COVID time. That was one of the best things that, that is one, one of the good things that USCIS has done, I think. Yeah. Can the beneficiary, the sponsor employee, respond directly to an RFE or is the cooperation of the petitioner, the employer is essential? So uh, H-1B is uh, a petitioner-based case. It's not a beneficiary-based case. So the beneficiary is not filing the case. It is the company or the petitioner that's filing the case. So a beneficiary, unfortunately, has no say. Um, has Is not a party in this in this transaction so they cannot respond only the petitioner can respond and if they decide not to then even though it's the beneficiary that's affected and might go out of status unfortunately that's how it is okay so is it a luck to be issued an rfe uh, if yes why so um as i, I said earlier about rfe is that uh, some of them are random uh, but some you can predict so as an attorney also, we try to file, <clears throat> uh, since we, you know, any attorney who has experience doing this, uh, we can predict. And that's why we file certain documents we think are essential in, when we're filing a H-1 in order to avoid an RFE. And those documents are, if you're again in the IT space, <clears throat> your basic documents, like the, uh, whichever space you're in, degree copies, you have to show that the person qualifies. So how do you show? You have to show that he has a, a degree that is related to the position. So if you don't submit a degree, you know there's going to be an RFE. So there's no luck there. Uh, or if you're working, uh, especially in the IT sector, you have to show that a job is available, that you're not firing a frivolous petition. In order to show a job is available, either you have to show what kind of business you're in. You have to show what kind of job the person is going to do. You have to document that. If he's working for a client side, you have to show the PO, the purchase order. If you don't have that, if you don't submit it, you know there's going to be an RFE. So there's no luck involved there. But sometimes you submit all the documents and still you get an RFE. That's where luck is involved. So that's sometimes that happens as well. Those are just random RFEs where, you know, I guess USCIS has some kind of a quota that they're trying to fulfill and they randomly select uh, some cases for an RFE. That's possible. So uh, with good documentation, there will be a uh, decrease of the risk of RFE. Absolutely, absolutely. So that's why we never file skeleton petitions. And we often fight with our clients to make sure our initial petition is, itself is well documented. Because what happens is when you get an RFE for one issue, they will send 10 different issues in that same RFE, which they otherwise may, they may not have, they wouldn't have come to their notice. So now instead of having one issue, they have 10 issues. And then so the chance of denial skyrockets once you get an RFE. So best strategy is to avoid an RFE by submitting all the documentation that's needed. Okay. So if someone have been in H-1B status for many years and never received an RFE, when time to extend status, either through the same employer or a different employer, will that person inoculated from receiving an RFP? Um, so previously, uh, they used to give deference if it was a H-1B extension. They always gave deference to that extension. And they would say that, you know, if it's an extension, then you should only be sending RFEs if it's you see something that has changed in the previous petition. But if, um, but with the Trump administration come in again, that's a change. That's another change. With this Buy America, Be America rule uh, memo that he issued, one of the results was that is was was a memorandum which was issued by USCIS that even in extensions, 
uh, you know, they should not uh, take it for granted. They should send a uh, look into the merits of the case once again, even though they were looked into previously. So they asked officers, adju adjudicating officers, to look into the issues, revisit the issues, basically, which was not done previously. They never used to. So we we often now don't see a difference between uh, extension versus a new H1. It's the same uh, chance of getting an RFE. Uh, previously, in an extension, the only RFE that they could send was um, just to make sure that they previously were in status. So if they were in a H1 for three years, they could send an RFE saying, show us that you were in status for the last three years. Show us your pay stubs, W2s, et cetera, et cetera. That was the only type of RFEs that we used to get now. Uh, even if the job hasn't changed, again, they ask for specialty occupation. Again, they're looking into the merits of it. They're looking into the job duties, whether the person qualifies or not, whether the job exists or not. They're looking into all these issues which they have already looked into. Um, so that is the difference, I think, between previously and now. 